Hello, and welcome to How to Research Like a Pro in 30 Minutes a Day. I'm Nicole Dyer, and I'm here with my mother, Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. We are the co-hosts of the Research Like a Pro genealogy podcast, and we also have a website called familylocket.com, where we write about genealogy and how to do better research. Thank you for joining us today, and we are so excited to talk with you about how we use this Research Like a Pro process in our everyday client projects and family research. We are both professional genealogists, and we have used this method with our students in our study group and online course to help them make more progress in their research. So we're looking forward to sharing it with you today. We're going to start today's class by telling you a little bit about our genealogy journey and how we got to where we are today. So in 2002, and this is our family picture taken about 2002, my husband and I had decided to make a big move and we moved from Seattle where we'd been for 17 years and moved to Highland, Utah. And you know, after you make a move, sometimes it takes a while to make friends and get to know things in the neighborhood. And I, that winter, I just didn't really have very much to do. All my kids were in school and I kind of started thinking I want to do family history. So I emailed my dad or actually I called him because he doesn't email or he didn't email. And I said, Hey dad, I want to do family history. Give me all your stuff. And he said, Oh, okay. I'm, I'm done. I can't use the computer. So let me give you all my stuff. And he's up in Idaho and I was here in Utah and he said, I'm your mother and I are going to Hawaii. This was mid-January, and he said, meet us at the airport, and I'll give you all my stuff. And he met me at the airport and gave me, of course, a suitcase with all of his papers. And I took that suitcase home, and I opened it up, and I was so excited to start digging through and trying to find all the records of my family. And that is what got me intrigued. And I was so lucky because the very next month, we had a local family history fair, and I started learning what to do with those papers. And I, you know, I had to get organized and start making some discoveries. So, Nicole, what were you doing that well, when <laughs> I was 16 and I had some time for new hobbies because I didn't have a lot of friends in the new area yet. So I started doing a lot of online research and it was exciting and fun. And I used to run out into the garden and say, Mom, look what I found. I found Eliza Ann Eisenhower on the census with her parents. And it was an exciting time for me. I loved it. Yeah, it was really fun. I couldn't believe I actually had a child who wanted to do this with me. So and I still can't believe I get to do this with my daughter. So it's super fun. Well, let's fast forward a few years. And 2014, everybody had grown up a bit and was out of the house except for maybe our youngest. And um, I was finding myself with wanting to kind of have a change in careers. I was getting tired teaching piano, didn't want to go back to teaching elementary school. And I'd been teaching a lot of classes at my local church on family history, and I was volunteering as a family history consultant. And I realized that I knew a lot about searching and helping people find stuff, but I didn't really know a whole process about researching. And I know I was missing something along the way. And Nicole, one day she said, have you ever thought about getting certified? And I really hadn't thought about that, but I decided to look into it. So I decided to do the BYU track on accreditation. It was for one of their conferences and learned all about it and decided to do accreditation. So Nicole, what were you doing, doing at this time? You had two little kids, as we can see in that picture. <laughs> Alice's face is kind of funny. So I had started teaching a community family history class and since I was teaching a lot, I thought it would be fun to have a website or a blog to put materials on. So we started a blog together and we called it familylocket.com. And it's been so fun working together with you, mom. And really the best part is getting to meet so many other people who are like-minded and who like to do family history with us. Absolutely. So in the next few years, we, we ended up doing a lot of stuff and a lot of people will ask how we even got started doing this but I have to say it really all came down to my accreditation because I went through two years of working on becoming accredited and by the end of it I'd been writing blog posts all along with Nicole and Family Locket but that summer after I got accredited I realized that I had learned so much and I really wanted to teach other people some of these steps and I realized that you didn't have to become certified accredited to learn how to research and do a research process and make real progress you just had to know the steps and I didn't know the steps before I had no idea that how you actually put this all together in a project and so I decided to start writing blog posts 
that's what I do. I just start writing blog posts and <laughs> getting it out there. So I did Research Like a Pro 1, Research Like a Pro 2, and, you know, did the whole series in blog posts first. And then I, re I just kept having this idea. It'd be really fun to do a study group. I had done a couple study groups, one for accreditation and one the ProGen study group that a lot of you maybe have done. And I kept thinking it'd be really fun to do Research Like a Pro as a study group and see if this works for everybody else, just like it does for me. Because, you know, at that point I was thinking, well, I don't know if this will work for other people. And we opened it up for registration and it filled up really fast. And we had all different people of experience. So we had my neighbor who was not as experienced with research. And then we had Sherry, who was a Boston University certificate genealogy program holder. And so I was thinking, oh, wow, we've got somebody here who really knows our stuff. Is it going to work? And it was super fun. And Nicole got to be in our first study group. How was that, Nicole? It was challenging at first because I had never written a source citation or really kept a log regularly. So it took a lot of discipline. And some of the things I didn't really want to do at first. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so amazing how much more I made progress with my question. Instead of just gathering and gathering and gathering, I finally synthesized what I found into an answer to a question. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah which is what is so fun about this method. So after we did the study group, we realized, hey, this really does work. We, But we could only work with like I don't even know. We probably did 12 people that first study mm -hmm. group, and we needed to, we needed to get it out to more people. So Roots Tech was coming up, and we decided to put it together into a book and launch it at Roots Tech, the ebook, and that was super fun. And we followed that with a print book. And thanks to Nicole, we got the print book done because she was the master of doing that. So thank you, Nicole. And we at this time we kept doing study groups, so we did like three study groups by this time, and. It, we realized that we could not reach very many people doing the study group because only a limited amount could do it. So we decided to do the e-course so that anybody could do it anytime they wanted. And we launched that in the fall. And that's been super fun. And that's when we started the podcast. So now you know uh, the timetable of Research Like a Pro, probably more than you wanted to know. But <laughs> more than you wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> but we just thought, you know, if some of you are new to us and don't know what we've been doing, that gives you kind of an idea. So I wanted to just... Um, just give a little bit uh, of a testimonial. And I think, Nicole, you're going to tell us about Rondi because you, you knew her first. Rondi is from my society here in Pima County, Arizona. And our genealogical society has been super interested in research like a pro and trying it out. Hi, Amy, our president. She's here. <laughs> so Rondi was really a great researcher before she started and very experienced. And then this is what she said about it. I solved a long-standing family mystery using the research methods Diana provided. I certainly became a research log enthusiast when I saw how much using the log helped me with the solution. And you can read the rest, but she gave a class at our society afterward about research logs and how much they helped. And, and she is just an advocate for using the log. And that is really one of the things that a lot of you said in that survey that we had you take. Some of you took the survey when you registered that you wish you were doing that you're not. And like, we're going to talk about that, but it's, it's really important, but hard. <laughs> it's hard at first and then it becomes easier. I promise. So I was a little curious because I knew with the study group, I could see people's progress and give them feedback immediately on their assignments. And I could see how they were progressing, but I, I felt a little bit more removed with the e-course because I didn't know how they were doing as much. We still do feedback if they want it. But sometimes people just want to do this on their own and they don't want anybody seeing their assignments, which I totally get. You know, sometimes you just want to do it yourself and, and do it in your own your own office or room. So I was really excited when we started getting feedback on the e-course after a few months and people had been through it. And um, Julie made such a great review that I thought I'd read a little bit. She said, I always wanted to follow a professional genealogist around as they did their research. That's how I felt. I wanted to know how they did their research so efficiently and effectively. Well, finally, Diana and Nicole have made this possible with the Research Like a Pro e-course. So I thought that was really fun because I felt that way too. How, what are professionals doing? I thought there had to be some secret, you know, do they have some secret website they go to to find all their stuff? And, you know, I can tell you now, no, we use exactly the same things that you guys are using, but it's the process that makes the difference. So we are excited to kind of give you some ideas today 
about some of these things. So when we ask that survey, like Nicole just referenced, these were the top three things that you don't have enough time to do your research, and I totally get that, that you're not using your research log and you know that's holding you back and that you're not writing your conclusions. So that was really interesting to read those. And hopefully you will get some ideas today about how to do a research log and writing your conclusions. And I'm gonna share how I did a project in 30 minutes a day. And I know that sounds crazy, but I think some of you probably participated with us in that 30 day challenge. And so you maybe know that it can be done too. So before we do that, um, Nicole, why don't you tell us a few more of the challenges that maybe people have written in about. We talked about a few of them. So are there yeah, any more in the chat? There's been a lot. Thank okay. you for all your responses. It's been fun reading these. Patricia said that she has struggles because of researching in areas before vital records were established and the churches didn't keep records back that far. And this is in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania in the 1840s and 60s. And um, there's a lot of different locations that are, people are saying that they have a brick wall in like Levittown, Pennsylvania. We have Sharon talking about Buffalo, New York and finding her great grandfather from the name on a grandfather's death certificate. Um, and Sandra is also from Buffalo, New York and her biggest challenge is finding death information for a great grandfather before deaths were recorded in Mississippi. And that is challenging because sometimes there just won't be a good death record before they started collecting those. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, Liz from Florida says that her challenges are brick walls and finding proper birth certificates since those are more accurate. And another challenge from Karen is completing the research fully. So maybe getting started but not finishing it all out. Another challenge is citing. And we know so many people are struggling with making citations and being disciplined to actually create the citation when you look at it the first time. Okay, well, those are all, oh my goodness, I think we all have those kind of challenges and especially those localities problems where the records are missing and you can't find what you want. So sometimes you have to, like Nicole said, you have to just come to the realization after you've done your exhaustive search that there may not be a death certificate or a birth certificate or a record. But we're going to hopefully show you how when you go through the process of research like a pro, you may find more out more than you think you might be able to. So let's just show you what the whole process is. And just going to run through these really quickly and then we'll go more in depth as we talk about how we did the 30 day challenge or the 30 minutes a day challenge. So the first thing that I learned doing accreditation was it's really important to take your research question and turn it into an objective which focuses your research instead of the scattergun approach about just trying to grab everything everywhere. We focus in on an objective and then we analyze everything we know. We have all gathered a bunch of sources. We have, have them on our trees here and there and files, papers on our desk. We have a bunch of things. So we have to put those together and we use a timeline and, and analyze those. And then we learn about the location. And this is often where you figure out where to go looking for that death record or that birth certificate or how to get around a burden county or when records didn't exist. So in the locality part, that's where we start really honing in on the records of our locality. Then we create a research plan and we actually make a plan. We prioritize and we figure out the steps that are most likely to give us the answer we're looking for. Of course, we have to do source citations. So we learn how to do source citations and we learn how to do a research log so that all of our research is there in front of us and that we don't do the same search over and over and over and over. So I hope I'm not the only one who has looked on a website multiple times and the record still isn't there. So when we have a research log and we actually record our record, our searches, we don't keep doing that. And then finally we write our conclusions. So I don't know if you guys do this, but I do this or I used to do this. You know, you'd, you'd have all these ideas and you do your research and you would think about all these great ideas for doing the next step, and but you never wrote it down. So then you had to repeat that. So when you write your conclusions, it helps you make connections and you figure out what to do next. And that's how you make progress in a hard brick wall problem. 
So the first time through the Research Like a Pro process, you may not solve your mystery. I'm like on my third iteration of my Cynthia Dillard project, but each time I get closer and closer. And so instead of feeling like you're never going to break down that brick wall, you just get closer and closer until you finally do figure something out. So let's talk about how that mini challenge went. And Nicole, you were the, you were the brainstorm behind that. How did you think of that? Well, in the study group, we typically spend longer on our assignments because we're usually working on a hard problem and spending a lot of time. But I thought it would be great for new people who are brand new to Research Like a Pro to try just doing a little bit a day so that it's not overwhelming. And so we tried this 14-day Research Like a Pro challenge where you only spend 15 to 30 minutes a day for 14 days, two weeks. So you spend two days on each step of the research like a pro process, just doing little bite-sized pieces and see if we can complete a research project and get familiar with the process. So we encourage all of you guys who are just starting with research like a pro, or maybe you just wanna get back into using the process after a break, that you start up again by just doing small chunks of time a little bit a day, because as you know, we are very busy as well, but we still need to make time for our research, especially for our client research. And sometimes we can only do that by doing little chunks a day. And the only way to stay organized throughout that process is by knowing where we are, which step we are on and what's next and keeping um, good track of that in our research plan and our research log. So we're gonna show you how we did that today. All right, so let's jump into my project. So I'm, we're going to use my case study, and I am going to go ahead and take off my camera. So, and Nicole's going to do the same so that you guys can see our slides, because I don't want to have us covering up any of these slides. So I decided when Nicole broached this whole idea, it was in January, and we didn't have a current study group going because we were starting that in March. And I just really thought it would be fun to get into some of my own research again. I'd been doing so many client projects. I hadn't gotten to my own research, which really is, is kind of the challenge of professional work. You sometimes don't get to your own. So I wanted to revisit my Nancy Briscoe Frazier. And you can see a picture of her, which I think is just, she's so adorable. This was toward the end of her, end of her life. And she's pictured here, I think it's in the mid 19 maybe about 1905 and she's in Indian Territory which was about to become the state of Oklahoma. So I decided to focus my little mini project on Nancy. So Nicole what was the first thing that we were supposed to do in the project? All right so the first part the short task was to just choose a research question and then the next day was to create that question into an objective. So just looking at your tree, finding someone you want to research, and then choose a question. And we encouraged everybody to choose some something that was not their brick wall the first time that they did the research like a pro process, because you want to be able to feel like you're making progress and having success when you use the process. And that will help you learn it so that, you know, after like three times of doing simple objectives, then you can move on to a difficult objective and you'll be able to know exactly what each step is. It won't be hard to create your source citations because you've already been through that and you'll have kind of a better idea of the flow. So we really encouraged everyone, especially when you are when you have limited time, the first time you do this, to start with a more simple objective. So say your brick wall is to find the parents of your third great grandmother. Maybe your first project leading you toward that objective would be to identify the later life of that third great grandmother and just figure out more about her and maybe those clues can later be applied to another project to find her parents. So might just consider choosing a simple objective the first time you do the process, especially if you're going to try doing 30 minutes a day. Perfect. So what did I decide to do? My research question was all about my Nancy Briscoe's life before her move to Oklahoma. So I knew a little bit about her. I think I knew more about her in her later years, like when she had all of her children. And pictured there on the right is my grandmother, Eddie Bell Harris. So missing in between, the missing link is, is Nancy's daughter and my Eddie's mother. But 
the um, I knew more about when they had moved out to Texas and Oklahoma Indian Territory had the censuses and felt like I knew a little bit about that era. What I didn't know was what had happened to her in her early years. She was born um, in the 1840s and, you know, in the 1850s and 60s. I was just really curious about that. So that was pretty easy for me to do that in 30 minutes a day. I literally just looked through my tree, settled on Nancy, and wrote my research question. So that one was really fast and easy to do. So the next step, though, was creating the objective. So tell us about objectives, Nicole. Well, the most important part of an objective is adding the key identifiers. So you want to have a statement of the purpose of your project with the subject's characteristics, like their birth date, death date, place of birth, those kinds of things. And of course, you're not going to have everything. That's why you're doing a research project about them. So you just put everything that you know, but not all of the background information, just some of the main things. So vital information, parents' names, and spouses' names are typically the best key identifiers. But if you don't have any of that, you can also just include a residence date and place if you have them on a census and their name or a name of another relative, like if you only have their son or daughter's name. You can also estimate if you don't have the exact dates, but it's really important to have something in your objective that identifies the person that you're researching so that as you go along, you can identify where you need to study your locality and what records you'll need to search. Okay, so thank you for that great explanation of what an objective is. So when I went to do my objective, I did just what Nicole talked about, and I used my um, key identifiers. So I'm just going to read through this and just look for those key identifiers of a specific date and place. And notice how I put in complete dates and places. So my remember my research question was to learn more about her life. So I turned that into objective and I said the objective for this project is to discover more about the life of Nancy E. Briscoe, born 7 February 1847 in Benton County, Arkansas. Nancy married Richard Frazier about 1865 in Missouri and died 30 January 1924 in Love County, Oklahoma. So you will notice that that's not like especially interesting to read and I'm not writing this to um, publish in a book or anything. This is to guide my research. This is to go at the top of my research log. This could be printed out and put in front of my computer so that I don't get going off on a crazy different track. This is what focuses me in on the next, well, I'm at day two. So this is the what I'm going to focus on for the next 12 days of my research. And this whole idea of creating an objective may be new to you, but it's super important. Now, you'll notice there in the middle, I didn't have a complete marriage date for Nancy's marriage to Richard Fraser. I was just estimating that off of the 1900 census, where she said she'd been married for 35 years. And, and I was just guessing Missouri, because that's where they were living, you know, in 1870. So sometimes in our objectives, we literally have to just put some estimates in there. You might be researching an ancestor. And you don't have a birth date. You only have a census. And so you're going to have to say born about 1832. And, and sometimes we have multiple places of birth, right? If we have those censuses with three different counties or three different states. So you do your best to estimate some information or put complete information in there. And you create an objective. So an objective very easily can be created in 30 minutes. Um, for this step of the research project. This one is so important, but it's something that often we think we'll just remember it and we keep it in our heads. And once we get it out of our heads and onto paper, that frees up our brain to think of a lot of other things. So writing our objectives is key. All right, we're on day three. So the third step is to gather all of the sources that you already have about that relative and put them into a simple timeline. And it's important to gather from what you've already found about them, but also from online trees, because you don't want to do a huge research project to only discover records that somebody else has already found. So make sure that you do a, a check of family search and ancestry trees just to see what others have already found about that person. And then add everything into a timeline. And we use 
spreadsheets for our timelines because it's a great way to organize your data, but you can use a table in a word processor as well or whatever you like to do. Some people generated a timeline by inputting facts into Roots Magic or whatever software that they use. Um, I really like the act of typing in and creating my timeline myself because it helps me to really wrap my mind around all of the events of that person's life. But if typing isn't fun for you, you can certainly generate one from your ancestry tree where you've attached sources or, or something like that. And Family Search also creates a timeline for you, which is nice. What you do though is you notice um, what you have and kind of what gaps you have. And this is gonna be really important as you start making your research plan. So just keep in mind that this timeline step is kind of the jumping off point for generating your questions and coming up with an idea of what you need to find and what you need to obtain in your research. So it, it, you could spend a lot of time on this, but our tip for staying within your 30 minutes on the timeline is to not stress about adding perfect source citations to your timeline. Just maybe add a link or a note about where that info came from. Just put each event there that you can. And if you run out of time, you can work on it again the next day. Right. So here's a sample of my timeline for Nancy Briscoe. And it's fun to color code. I did this in Google Sheets, and then I color coded the different events. So I put all the censuses in green, and then I have, you know, other things in different colors. So when I was finished with my timeline, I had six birth events. And remember, I had that marriage date, estimated marriage date, had six residences, a widow's pension record, and a burial record. So that's what I had. And you might, if you're doing a more involved project, you might end up with a timeline and a lot of records. But I hadn't researched, you know, this, this, I hadn't done a reasonably exhaustive research on this ancestor, so I didn't have that much. The kind of fun thing was that as I was gathering up my records, I was using my database, um, and then I was went to my ancestry tree and was seeing if there was anything else on there that I hadn't put in my database. Because sometimes we do that, right? We add attach hints on our family search tree or my heritage tree or ancestry tree, and we don't always get it into our own database. Well, I found a record just like that, and it was an index record. It was a pension card, and it was on my ancestry tree. And when I had originally attached it, I just didn't really know about you know, pension cards and looking for original pension applications. This was several years ago and I didn't know about that. But in my accreditation project, I had just found the pension for another great grandmother in Oklahoma. And as soon as I saw that card, I realized I could go get the original pension and it was digitized, which is the great thing. So right then, I went and I clicked over and I got the pension. So you might be looking through all your information and realize you've got some of those derivative records, just indexes. And if you want to right then, you can go get the original so that you can have that as part of your analysis. But if it's going to be something that's more involved to get the original, then just put that in your research plan. So for instance, you might need to track down a church record you know, somewhere, and that's going to be more difficult to find and figure out. So you don't always have to go find the original at this step. It can work perfectly to put it in your research plan. But because I knew exactly where to look, because I had just done it for another relative, I looked at it. Well, guess what was in that pension? It was so exciting because in the pension, Nancy Briscoe had to state her date of marriage and her place. And that's what you're seeing right there in pink. She said she was married October of 1863 in McDonald County, Missouri. And so that was really, really great. And because it's a pension, she also tells her husband's service. She had to, you know, say what unit he was in. And so I got that information as well, which was really, really helpful. So in just doing my analysis for my timeline, I discovered more about this ancestor. And we hear that all the time from people in the study group. In fact, sometimes in our study group, People do this analysis phase and they find they answer the research question. They reach their objective right here and then they have to broaden their objective because guess what? That answer was hiding right there in your information in plain sight, but because you hadn't recorded it, you didn't see it. So the timeline analysis is one of my favorite parts. And I do this for every client project. I put all the known information into a timeline. And like Nicole said, 
I did not do all these complete source citations when I first did the timeline because that comes later. I just quickly put in, you know, where it was from, 1850 census, and then I came back and added those in the source citation part. So that's why it can go a little bit faster than it might think. All right, so on day four, we had everyone go through and analyze their sources. So this is where you look at each event in your timeline and analyze the source information and sometimes the evidence. So the source, is the container of the information where you found that record. And it can be either original, derivative, or authored. Genealogists prefer original sources. Derivatives, like the index card that Diana found, don't have all the information. So sometimes creating your timeline will tip you off that you need to go get the original. And you can do that then, right then if you know how to get it, or if you don't, you can put it in your research plan and figure out how to get it during your locality research step. The information within a source can be either primary, secondary, or unknown. Genealogists prefer primary information, which is from an eyewitness informant. The way to analyze whether an information item is primary or secondary is to figure out who the informant was. And sometimes that person is unknown, like the informant on a census record for the household information is probably the head of household but we don't know for sure. It could have been the wife or another person living in the home. So oftentimes we will just put unknown in our information section or undetermined because we don't know who the informant was. But if we can figure out if it was a primary or secondary informant, then we can put that. And if it's secondary, then we'll wanna try in our research plan to find um, a source that maybe has primary information because that could be more reliable than secondary or hearsay. So that is the chance as you go through your timeline to analyze each information item and figure out if you have all the, the best sources that you can. And if you have a lot of derivatives, then it's a time to recognize, I'm going to go order the original certificate. And during your locality research, you can learn to do that. You can also notice any gaps and write down questions or ideas that you have about your ancestor's life. When I did my Lucinda Keaton project, I had a hypothesis that her father was William Keaton. And when I made a timeline for William, I found that he did not appear on the 1830 census. And I realized that he owned land. And I realized that he probably had an estate or probate file. So that was one of the first things I put in my, pro in my research plan because I recognized through the timeline creation that I would probably find that source after 1830. So the timeline really helps you see gaps and notice places where you might be able to find a source. Right. And I love the idea of actually recording those questions. How many times do we come up with a question and then we don't have a place to put it and we forget about it where it might have been really key to our research. So I had a really big question as I was doing my analysis. So this is the second half of my timeline where I do the analysis of the source, the information, the evidence, and I have my notes. So you can see this is not a real easy to read census. So if you look up in the notes, you can see who was in this household. So my Nancy E. Briscoe, I think is there as the 10 year old, but she's in a different household now, which is kind of raising some red flags. I had just attached this as a source. I had it in my database and in, to give you a little background, 1850, she's with her parents, John and Susanna Briscoe, with a whole bunch of children. And so why am I thinking that this is still her? Um, well, it's because there was an Isaac in her household and a Mahala. And so I'm thinking, okay, so is this an aunt? Who's Nancy Briscoe, age 53? Well, I don't know, but I put that in my research question area because now I'm looking this, analyzing this, and it's raising some red flags, some questions, and I'm wanting to know. Um, so you'll see that across the top, I decided that the census was an original source, and it was primary information for the residents because we know the census taker, he had to have the residents you know, to take to, he had to write that at the top of the census, exactly where he was, what township, what state, county. So we know the residents would be primary information, 
but we have no idea who the informant is here. Was it Nancy Briscoe, the head of household? Was it the neighbor? Was it Isaac, the oldest boy? We don't know, so we have to say that it's unknown or undetermined information. And then with the evidence that this is giving me, it's giving me direct evidence for the residents. If my question was, where were they living? I have direct evidence that stated directly where they were living. And for their names, if I want to know what their name was, I've got the names of the household and how old the children were. So this is just a place for you to look at your sources, think about what you're seeing in them. You might have a family Bible and you were just taking all the information in that family Bible and believing all of it. But when you did your analysis, you realized that that family Bible was written 100 years after the fact for each thing written in there, that it was written by a great granddaughter. And then you can see that, oh, OK, I may not give as much credence to this information because it wasn't recorded at the time of the event. It's not primary information. So it helps you to understand when you have a conflict and you will have conflicts in your information, which one to give more weight to, how to explain, you know, this conflict of different birth dates, different birth places. So the analysis is so important as we are working through our research to figure out what is right, what is wrong, and to help us to make more conclusions. All right, on day five, it's time to jump into locality research. Choose a locality that you think will be the place where the answer to your research question will be, and start making like a one-page document about that locality with some of the basic information like county formation date and the parent county. You know, typically we do county guides because we do research in the United States and that's a lot of the places, the, the counties are usually where the records are kept for specific information. So, but you can do a state guide or whatever. You wanna include boundary changes, neighboring counties, the date that vital records began being kept, the town that was the county seat, other major towns, and especially Try to find out if there was any record loss in that state or area county. Um, also, look at the Family Search Wiki article about that locality and look at a map of that county and maybe even a map of the state showing all the counties so you can see the neighboring areas. So, that's kind of the basic information we encourage you to find out before you dive into researching in that area. Okay, so the challenge here for anybody who's done a locality guide is trying to figure out how to do this in a shorter amount of time. If you're trying to do this in 30 minutes a day, you've really got to narrow your focus of about the locality. And I have spent hours and hours on locality guides, and I knew I didn't have time to do that. And also, when I'm doing a client project, I don't have hours and hours to do a locality guide. I need to get up to speed on that locality very, very quickly. So in this one, I decided to narrow in on two counties because Nancy Briscoe had said she was married in McDonald County and born in Berry County. And you'll see circled, I have the Arkansas location where her family was prior to going to Missouri. And so it was really helpful for me to see that it really was just right across the border. That map doesn't really have it connected, but they literally just moved across the border to the next state. So I wanted to find out what kind of records, what kind of things were available in those two Missouri counties. And you'll notice that, of course, the courthouse burned in 1863 in one and 1861 in the other one. And so that, those are the challenges we have in a lot of our Southern research. But I was able to do my quick, my quick locality guides because I went first of all to the Family Search Wiki. So that is what I always do. Most of the time the Wiki gives me fabulous information on what records are available, gives me places to go to find other types of information. So I highly recommend starting with the wiki and then sometimes I'll go to Wikipedia or just do a Google search to, to learn about the county. So in this part of the locality guide, I just wanted to find out a little bit about the history and the geography and the maps because I knew we were going to do records with the next day's portion. So ordinarily I do it all at once, but because we were just doing 30 minutes a day, for this part of it, I discovered and I focused it focused in on the history the area of the area between about 1850 and 1880, the years that I knew Nancy was in this area. 
I did not worry about anything in the 1900s. I didn't worry about anything in territorial periods. I focused in on this time period, which helped make my guide go a little bit faster. The next step on day six is to find the record collections that are available in that locality. So you're going to want to make a list of important record groups and where to find them on, online. And you can spend a lot of time doing this, but if you're limited on time, just narrow your focus. Only find record groups that are in your time frame that you are currently researching in and make a short list. Maybe just focus on two record collections that you find in the Family Search Wiki and um, the rest, you should get them from the Family Search catalog because typically the records in the Family Search catalog are more of those difficult records that you maybe didn't realize were online. And the Family Search library has been digitizing all their microfilm reels. So you might be surprised with what records you can actually access from home. A lot of you have been saying that you haven't been able to find things online. So make sure you check the Family Search catalog. That's where you'll be able to see a lot more court records, land, tax, and other kinds of digitized records that maybe weren't available five or 10 years ago. Great, and I love the Family Search catalog and the wiki. In fact, that's where I go for my client projects. I go straight to the catalog because so much is online. So what did I find? What did I decide to put into my locality guide for my specific project? I use the Family Search Wiki to quickly find that for these counties there were digitized county histories. And because I wanted to learn about a specific period of time, I had a feeling there would be county histories that wrote about that. So you'll see there the one in the middle. It was published in 1897. So just think about that. Somebody's writing a county history is published in 1897. Are they going to have some great information about the 1860s, you know, Civil War era? I would imagine so. So I put that into my locality guide. And then I also wanted to learn about Civil War service of Richard Frazier. Since we had his pension or his widow's pension, we knew that he had served. So I put in some records for Civil War. And I did not worry about doing a lot of other records because I remember I only had 30 minutes. So I didn't do probate records. I didn't do birth records. I didn't do things that didn't go with my objective and my focus for this project. So if your focus was to, you know, search for birth records, then you'd be wanting, you'd be wanting to put in records here, possible record collections that would help you with your specific objective, your specific focus. All right, on day seven, the task was to make a hypothesis. And this is fun, I think. A lot of people, the first time they do it, wonder what to write. Basically, you take what you've learned from your timeline and your source analysis, and you come up with the most likely scenario for an answer to your research question. So if you had to guess what the answer to your research question was, what would you put? Obviously, if it's, you know, you're trying to find a parent, you're not gonna be able to say, well, I think it's this random name. You'll just put, I think it's a, a man who was born or resided in South Carolina, who was probably born about 1780 to 1800, right? So you're just kind of guessing, like if you had to come up with a profile for this mystery person, or if you had to just come up with a, a nonfiction story that answered your research question, what do you think the most likely or a fictional story of what an answer to your research question would be, what is the most likely scenario? So you're not really taking a while to guess, but you are kind of using some of the facts that you found to make an educated guess. And you don't need to include source citations as you create your hypothesis. This is just a flexible theory that you're going to test by searching in records. Right, so what did I do for my hypothesis? Well, that widow's pension had given me the information that her husband, Richard, served in the Confederacy, and I knew I wanted to know more about that era with Nancy being a young woman. So this was the hypothesis I came up with. Nancy Briscoe experienced the Civil War as a young woman growing up on the border of Arkansas and Missouri. The devastation of war precipitated the move of Nancy and her Confederate veteran husband, Richard Frazier, to Texas by 1870 and shaped the remainder of her life. So in this one, I'm, I'm just sort of guessing that that's why they moved to Texas, but I don't really know anything about that county yet about what happened during the Civil War. I am just making a hypothesis. There had to be some reason that they moved, and that was my best guess. 
So a lot of people do get hung up with the hypothesis because they, they think they have to know the answer. But we are making a guess. And I agree with Nicole. This is, I really love doing the hypothesis because you can prove or disprove ideas. And it's really fun to give yourself the freedom to imagine what could have happened. Okay, on day eight, you're going to make your research plan. You already have a list of sources that you might want to search. And now you're going to make a prioritized plan. It's really important that you create a plan for what to search first, because some records are more likely to contain the answer than others. And so make sure you put the one at the very beginning that could that's most likely to have the answer. In my case, I put that probate record for William Keaton because I thought it would list all of his children. And it did when I finished my project. So make sure that you try to think what will be the most likely to answer your question. And you can also take into account what will be the most accessible records. But if you only search the most accessible records instead of the ones that are most likely to answer your question, you may not ever solve the, the question. So a lot of you said your challenge is finding those offline records. So if the number one record that you need to answer your objective is offline, then you'll put it in your plan to write, to order, to do whatever you can to get that record or hire someone to go look it up at the Family History Library or at the Library of Virginia, whatever it takes. All right, and make sure that you keep your research plan flexible. A short list is best because you may find the answer in the first or second source that you search, or you may disprove your theory in those first two. So you may want to rearrange the order of what you search next or completely change your plan. So if you make too long of a list, you might be wasting your time. So we encourage you to just start with a short list. Right. So let's take a look and see what I did for my plan. And I really wanted to search the county histories first. Well, for one thing, I knew that was a digitized book. And I knew if I only had 30 minutes to research, I wanted to start with, with the digitized book. I didn't want to take the time to go up to the Family History Library or order it into interlibrary loan. If I had had to have done that, I maybe would have put it number four. But it was it was available, so I put it number one. And then I wanted to look at maps, and I knew I could do that from home. And I wanted to look for the Civil War Service information, and I knew I could do that from home. So for this project, I was able to do all my research online on the computer. But like Nicole said, if this was a brick wall and I needed to contact someone in a local area, I could just put my next action on here. I wouldn't have to put to, um, discover the birth certificate. I could simply put as my next action to write for the birth certificate. So we just can put the next step of what we need to do for our research to actually make progress. Now you'll notice at the very end I put that 1860 census that I was confused about. I didn't put that very first because it wasn't really the focus of this research plan. Yes, it, it would tell me more about Nancy's early life, which is the objective, but I'm focusing in more here on her years where it was during the Civil War. And I had a feeling that that could take me off onto a different track. So I put it last in case I had time to get to it and to see if I could work on it. But what do I do with that if I don't have time to get to it? I can put it in my future research suggestions and I could do a whole nother project on that now. So that is how I prioritized my research plan. All right, on day nine, we gave everybody the task to make one to two source citations for events in your timeline. So this was just a practice to kind of practice with your citations and because you'll probably need to use some of these citations in your report. Okay, so let's take a look at one of my source citations. Now I was able to do this pretty quick because I have a citation template. I had started my citation template when I did accreditation because I knew that as a professional, I needed to know how to do citations really fast and a template helps. It's a brilliant idea to keep yourself moving forward and make it easier. So I was able to do this in 30 minutes to do my citations. But if you're new to doing citations, then it might be a little bit more ponderous or more difficult. So I would suggest that you just keep it pretty simple. And we teach the method of the five questions. So I teach um, who created the source, what is the source, when was the source, where in is the source, and where is the source. So, you know, we have more information on that in the book and in the 
the courses on podcasts about source citations that you can learn more. But for the purpose of this, put as much information there as you think you need to to get back to the source or to lead someone else to it. And don't worry about being super picky with if you've got everything in the right order. You know, I've done study groups before where we're all given the same source and there's 10 of us and we come up with 10 different source citations. And they're all perfectly fine. They all get us where we need to go, but everybody does it just a little different. So if source citations are hanging you up and keeping you from making progress, just start writing them and then you can get better and better as you keep going. All right, day 10 was practicing with source citations again. So we had everyone go back and make two more source citations. And we know that source citations can be a hang up. So we thought it would be good to just practice again and to not get overwhelmed. Just know that your first few citations are gonna take you longer. And um, that's why it's so important to save every citation that you make into a, a document where you can reference them later. Like Diana said, with a template where you can just copy and paste that citation for the 1910 census for one of your other ancestors, and then paste it into the research log for your current ancestor that you're working on and change the pertinent details. That will save you a lot of time. Right, and that's exactly what I do for my censuses. Whoops, went one too far there. So I have a source citation template and for every single census I have it, have the sample. So it's really easy just to go in and change the information. Um, the locations, the household number, the name of the household, having everything already there in an order makes it super easy. So when I did this step of the, the mini challenge, it was really easy for me to do. And I was able to just get my information in there. Now I wanted to show you this example because this is a Laird citation and a lot of times we are looking at records online. So you'll notice that first part of it Everything down to the semicolon there in the middle is the physical description. This is what that census is telling us. The year, the place, the household number, and Richard Fraser household. Then after the semicolon, that is telling us where I saw this. I saw it on Ancestry. And then another semicolon is telling us where it is held at the National Archives. So layered citations, that's how we explain where we saw something. So I like the explanation that a lot of people use to cite what you see. So I saw this census and I have the information about exactly what I saw and then I saw it on Ancestry. So I cited that and then at the very end I could just put my reference. I was citing National Archives. So if you think about what you're seeing that might help you to figure out how to cite a source. And like I said before, if you get confused, don't worry about it. Just put something in there, do the best you can. And as you continue learning, you can go back and, and work on your source citations. And we always just try to remember that citation is an art, not a science. So if you're, and that was by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. So just remember that you can do it a little bit differently than other people, as long as you include answers to all of the main questions. Right. All right, Perfect. the 11. Research logs. So now that you've practiced a little bit with source citations on your timeline, it's time to start researching the items on your research plan. And as you do so, you keep track of each search in your research log. And you create a source citation every time you do a search, even if it's a negative search. And you, you do your source citation each time you look at a new record. The first time you look at a record is when you should create the citation. You should also keep a link to that database that you searched or the exact record which you saw in your research log. Right, and my research log, I say it all the time, is my workhorse. I absolutely love my research log because it is where I keep my brains of the project. And one of the first things I do, like Nicole said, is to create the source citation. And so you can see here that I actually have the same source citation copied four different times and it's that county history. That was number one on my research plan, so I searched that first. The only difference is the page number at the end of the site at the end of the citation. So it's so easy if you are doing this in like Excel or a Google Sheet, this is a Google Sheet, where you create your source citation, then you can just copy and paste for each new entry and change the image number, change the page number, change that little bit of identifying information that you need.
So I went through, I looked at the digitized book, and I went through and I pulled out the inter the information that I thought was most inf interesting or most beneficial for my research. And then I typed it in there. And I used quotes if I was using, you know, direct quotes from the book so that I made sure that I would give proper credit to that book. And then when I was ready to write my report, I had it all ready to go. I could literally copy and paste from my research log straight into my report. So I also do a link back to the actual page in case I need to go back and reference the book. You know, you can see if you look closely at my results comment section, I have several typos because I'm obviously typing fast and I can go check the original, make sure I haven't messed it up or, or see if I need to check information. So I learned some really interesting facts from that county history, such as the fact that the big problem after the war was petty thieving and it was so bad people were never safe to turn their hogs on range which was their chief source of profit. So I could just imagine this area and my ancestor, Nancy Briscoe, there trying to farm or do whatever with all this thieving and all this mess after the Civil War. So I was having a lot of fun with this project at this point. The research is always the, my favorite part, but I say that about a lot of the steps, uh, <laughs> the analysis too. Well, how long is it going to take to finish all of the research in your log? We were just doing a 14 day challenge, but if you're just making a goal to research for 30 minutes a day, you might want to spend um, 30 minutes on just one search. That might be how long it takes to search the database, find the record, abstract or, or transcribe what you found into your research log or into a transcription, make your citation, and then be done for the day. You might need to spend several days doing your research log and researching everything in your plan. It just depends. When I'm working on my client project that I'm currently doing, sometimes all that I can do is search one or two things and then it's time to get the kids up for school and do something else. So I know that if I've been keeping track of where I am in my research log, I can see clearly what the next step is. And that really is the key for being able to do research in small increments of time is keeping track in the log. You know exactly where you've been and what to do next because you can see where you are in your plan. Exactly. And you know, when you're doing it in a form like this, you can even highlight something like all in red and make yourself a note and say, next time I'm researching, I need to look at this. You know, give yourself some hints and clues in case you have to leave it and go on a trip and come back to it. You can remember what to do next. So, um, on my next day of researching, I wanted to tackle those Civil War service records, and I was able to find four records, and you'll notice I did the same thing. I created my source citation the first time I looked at the record, and then I just edited the information as I put things in. So most of those pieces of information were on page three, and then one was down on page five, or volume, yeah page five. So anyway, I would just change my source citation a little bit to match what I needed to um, for where that specific piece of information was coming from. So this was really helpful to see my see everything on my screen and to make connections. I was able to learn that Richard was a teamster and he was a prisoner of war and that he had served under this Captain Clanton who was I'm sure a relative because Nancy Briscoe's mother was a Clanton and of course everybody's all related there in the area of Missouri and Arkansas anyway I'm thinking. So this was very helpful in putting it all together and again as I wrote my report I had the information right in front of me. I had extracted it out and there it was. All right. Well, after you're done with researching everything in your plan, it's time to write your conclusions. What did you find? What did you not find? A lot of people get overwhelmed with this step. So we decided to break it into two chunks with day 13 being writing an outline and day 14 being writing the report. However, you may want to break this up into several days where you write an outline, then you start writing about one of the things in your outline for one day and then so on for several days. It just depends on how much you're writing and how long your report will be. We really encourage you to start with a short summary, just a few paragraphs about what you found, because if it's too overwhelming, you're just not gonna write. 
So make sure that you just write something, whether or not it's perfect or source cited. Of course, we hope that it's source cited since you made your source citations, but just start somewhere. And with the report outline, you can just kind of go through your research log and put everything into order. You might want to do chronological order. You might want to do an order by record type or an order of how you found them, what makes sense to you. Right. And so this was my outline. And we have a, a research project document that we are sharing with you that gives the structure of how to do a report. And I use this for my client projects as well as my own. So there goes your objective again. And then some of the background information. What did you learn as you're doing your locality guide? You know, some things to set the stage. And then you can just, you can put in the order that you want to talk about the different things that you found. So I put in the pension, the birth, civil war information. And then I was going to do a conclusion and my suggestions for the future research. So it's pretty simple. This was a small project. And so I I looked through my research log and thought about the different things I wanted to mention and I made my outline and I really like doing outlines because then it helps us to reorder things but the great thing about writing if we're writing in a word processing program we can write out a whole paragraph and if we decide we want it to be earlier in the report we can move it super easy to move our information around and like Nicole said sometimes you just have to start writing if you have writer's block just start writing about the records and then things will start to come to you and it will get easier I know when I first started writing I had no idea what I was doing but the more I did it the easier it got day 14 is report writing and to write your report just go through each item in your outline and spend some time talking about that search or that record that you found and then if you didn't find anything you do need to talk about that and just say i searched this database but i didn't find anything and you can put a footnote to a citation that says negative search for such and such but you'll talk about um, the source and the record that you found in the report, each one, and you'll want to also talk about how reliable those sources are. If you found an authored source that seems to be written by a well-known genealogist or somebody who was um, citing a lot of good records, then you can say this seems reliable. But if you found an online tree that doesn't seem very well cited, you can say this doesn't seem to be very reliable. And then if you found a birth record that was created six months after the person's birth, you'll wanna write that into the report. This is where you can really analyze each record and say, this seems very reliable because the doctor was reporting on the day the child was born, or this isn't reliable because the doctor rewrote this six months later. Right. This is where you kind of make sense of everything that you've researched. So I'm just going to show you three simple slides of what I put in my report because obviously I don't have time to go through the whole thing. But here's just a little example of the background information. I wrote just a simple little statement about um, the area and I had a map. I love to put in maps and visuals in there because I think it helps break up the text. So I just talked about how in the county history, you know, and that's what I use for my citation, which I can't show here, that they talked about how the land was really good and everybody farmed there. Um, and so I set the stage a little bit with that. And then I had several conflicting dates and places for Nancy's birth. I had Arkansas, Missouri, 1847 and 48. And I decided to, to address that and put it in a table. Sometimes it's easier just to see the information when it's put in a table rather than to write it all out in paragraph after paragraph. And you'll see in the notes that I put in who the informant was. And I decided that when Nancy herself gave the information, she said she was born in 1848 and in Barry County, Missouri. So I decided that that was likely the most accurate date. When you are doing genealogy writing, you always want to use certain words because we're never absolutely sure. I mean, this is my best guess. So that's why I say this is likely the most accurate date. I don't say this is absolutely the most accurate date. So we use things like probably, possibly, almost certainly, because we need to qualify the information. We don't know. We might, I might find a church record that would overturn that, and then I'd have to backtrack. So in my report, after I had gone through all the different things, I did my conclusion, then I put my suggestions for the future. And this is for me more than anybody else, because when I pick up this report, I want to know what I was going to do next. And if you're doing client work, then this tells the client, oh, I could hire that person again because there is more to do.
So all along I've talked about that 1860 census, and so my future ideas are to really work on the people in that 1860 census. And I put that there to remind me that I have not figured this out yet, and I need to figure it out. But I can finish up this project. This project is done. I discovered so much about Nancy, and I can consider this one done, and then move on to a brand new project in the future that would revisit this family with a different objective and a different focus. Okay, so we have talked all about a whole bunch of different things with the Research Like a Pro process. So what was the outcome of my project? Well, I hadn't researched this family for a long time, and it was so fun to revisit them, and it helped me stay focused. I really didn't jump off when I really easily could have because I had my objective. And even though this wasn't necessarily a brick wall ancestor, that marriage was a brick wall. I didn't know that. And so I found out several things to help me further my knowledge of this family. And now I have a written narrative about her and a jumping off point for when I research next. So for me, it was super valuable. Okay, so you may be wondering, you know, what you can do to learn more. And so we really want to invite you to join our online course if you'd love to learn more. And I know a lot of you watching have already done the course or been through the study group, but for everybody that's new or doesn't know anything about it, we're going to, to just quickly run through some of the things. We get a lot of questions about what it's like and people wondering um, what it would be like. Well, we created the e-course because a lot of people in the study group who, who may have wanted to sign up for the study group were saying, well, it's hard to meet at you know, that time, even though I want to do it. So we thought they could just do it at their own, on their own time, at their own pace. So that's one of the great benefits of the e-course is that you can watch the video modules and take the quizzes whenever you want. You can do it all in one day if you want to just binge watch, or you can do it once a week, whenever it works best for your schedule. And um, when you sign up, you'll um, receive access to the e-course on our website, familylocket.com. And so we're going to go over all of these different parts of the e-course. And please let us know if you have any questions about that. And then when we're done going through the e-course, we'll answer a bunch more questions about the presentation and any questions you might have. And um, if you're ready to go to the website and sign up for the e-course, just go to familylocket.com slash shop. Okay, so working at your own pace is super important for a lot of people. And we've had people that have gone through the e-course in like a month and others that are still working through it and they've had to stop. So it's really great that you get to spend as much time as you want on an assignment and you don't have to really stress about getting it done in a certain amount of time. So it's fun because we set it up to track your progress. So if you like checking off little check boxes, you certainly can do that. And you can see how you're doing. If you have to stop for a little bit, you can come back and see where you're at in the process. We have eight 30 to 60 minute teaching sessions. So what, what I did was I recorded Research Like a Pro study group number three. And so it's just like you are in a study group and you can stop and you can answer the questions and write things down just like you are working through the study group with me right there in person. And you'll see the answers and see what other people answer the question. And you'll notice that there are seven parts of Research Like a Pro, but we have eight sessions. And that's because the eighth one is all about organization and productivity and education. So I knew that that was an important part of the process of any genealogy process, and so I threw that one in there. We have quizzes so that you can see if you really got it, and you can take them as many times as you need to and see if you are really understanding the information. And then we have Ask Diana office hours. I really wanted to have a way to give people feedback and, and to answer things live. And so once a month, if you're a part of the e-course or the study group, you can come on a call live with me and we use Zoom so we get to see each other and talk back and forth. You send in a question and your question can be anything. So we talk about everything from Evernote to organizing your research to um, finding specific records, making specific citations. So it's just a way for you to get your questions answered exactly what you want to know. And those are really fun. We go back and forth between daytime and evening so we can get 
everyone who has different schedules and those are every month. Whoops, and then when you join the eCourse, you also get a fun flow chart. One of our study group members said, can we just have this all on one piece of paper? And Nicole was really great and figured out how to get it all there. So if you have one a chart and have it on your wall with all the steps, you can download that and have it right there next to your computer. We have an assignment and a work sample multiple work samples for each of the specific modules. So if you learn by really reading what other people are doing, you can see examples from both Nicole and I in our projects. And we have all sorts of different kinds of projects there that you can read and study and learn from. And we also have a lot of different links to other reading and podcast episodes that we've done. So we to try to give you all of our helps that we've done for all these different modules right there on the eCourse. So you don't have to go hunting all over the place for them. They're all right there together. I love this little thought because I wanted to know, you know, I was curious about how people felt with the feedback with the eCourse. And so Karen, one of our members said, Research Like a Pro eCourse worked well for me. The easy to use format keeps you on task. Start with a video and practice the techniques with assignments to get the most out of the course. Post your assignments in the Facebook forum and get feedback. Then take the quiz and see how much you've learned. Diana Elder breaks research into bite-sized pieces so you can learn to be more efficient and productive. So thank you, Karen, for that great, you know, that great little review. But I love what she talked to, how she enjoyed getting feedback from putting her assignments in the Facebook forum. So if you've bought the book or are part of the study group or e-course, you can be in our private Facebook group. But if you don't want to have your information or your assignments out there for everyone else to read, you can certainly just send me an email with your assignment and I can give you feedback. So we want to make sure everybody gets feedback that wants feedback. When you finish everything up, your final thing will be to upload your research report and I go through and give you feedback on that and then you get a certificate because, you know, sometimes you want that certificate when you've finally been through everything that you've um, signed up to do. So here are some of the outcomes. You will have a process to follow and I know a lot of you are just kind of scrambling not knowing what to do with how to research. So. You have a process and when you start feeling like you're getting out of whack, you go back and you say, okay, I'm on this step. What am I supposed to be doing here? It helps you use your time efficiently. So if you only have 30 minutes, like we've talked about today, you can make progress. You can actually work through a whole project on your brick wall and then start a new project because you will have learned so much from the first one. You're going to learn more about your ancestors, just like I did, and you're going to feel in control instead of feeling like you are wandering out there and don't have a clue about what to do. If you have any questions at all about our online course, Research Like a Pro, please feel free to email us at diana at familylocket.com or nicole at familylocket.com, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. To learn more about our Research Like a Pro online course, go to familylocket.com slash shop. And there you can read all about how the course works and read reviews from past students. We are so happy that you joined us for our class today about how to research like a pro in 30 minutes a day. And we wish the best to you with your research. Thank you.